lecture on principles of consumer testing. Many of the things that I'm going to talk about today, at least I hope, you've already mastered in terms of their application to other types of sensory evaluation tests because much of what we talk about is what might be considered good experimental design principles and not necessarily only applicable to consumer type research. There are, however, some aspects which are at least, if not unique, more emphasized in consumer oriented testing and if nothing else, some of the discussion may operate as a review. First of all, let's talk about why consumer testing. I think from the lecture last time, we've gotten an, a clue to the fact that if we look at sensory evaluation in terms of the type of people that evaluate the product, either as a representative of an instrument or as a representative of the consumer, and we gave some of the reasons why at that time, I think we have the fundamental reason that consumer testing is done. Also, when I pointed out how important it was that information be gained relative to what products would be more or less likely to be successful in the marketplace, and how critical that information was as early in the game as possible in order to minimize cost and time and effort, one can see very good reasons why consumer testing as an aspect of sensory evaluation has become more and more critical. Now, we talked about kinds of evaluation last time, affective, discriminative, and descriptive, and most of what I'm going to talk about would be the affective type of consumer testing. However, there is no reason why consumers or representative consumers cannot be used for descriptive or discriminative type work. On the other hand, one can easily see that as the methods become more sophisticated, as it requires training, uh, that fairly soon you'll find the consumers that you're using are no longer representative. They've now become trained in some way. So it becomes a fine point when you leave what might be called the instrument type and the consumer type. That's why I'm going to stick primarily to the affective type of testing. All right, let's take a look at where. Where does consumer testing take place from a physical sense? Well, there are a variety of places that it does take place and for a variety of reasons. Certainly one of the places it, it happens is right in a laboratory, in a set of taste panel booths similar to the kind that are in Rote House and in Cruz. And under these conditions in a laboratory, you know that you probably get some individual separation between the panelists and that you have a very good control over it, what it is that they're going to be evaluating and perhaps even the time sequence. The laboratory type of consumer evaluation is quite common and later in some of the discussion you'll see some of the additional advantages as well as disadvantages to this particular location. Another general location has the uh, rubric central location and as a uh, term central location it means basically that people come to it. Now, how does it differ from the laboratory? Well, in some ways you might say it's the same thing if in fact the place that people come is a taste panel booth situation. But by common usage, central location has generally come to mean a less controlled situation. Uh, some place where, in fact, you don't have quite the same degree of control as you do in the laboratory. Now, we can break it down into two basic kinds of central location, the permanent type and the temporary type. Now, the permanent central location is something like what you might have if you have a booth, as General Foods does, or did at least, at the 
Grand Central Station in New York, where people come by off the trains and stop and evaluate product. Or the Swift Company in Chicago has a permanent location in the Museum of Science and Industry. And as people walk through, they're attracted to the display and they evaluate products. Well, these are permanent facilities, or relatively permanent, in which you essentially depend on people walking by. Uh, you could have a permanent facility where you actually recruit people to come in, where you actively go out and recruit them. So these two kinds are passive, where the people just, as I said, walk by. But you might send out cards or letters to people from the telephone directory or a city directory and actually invite people to come to some particular permanent location. The temporary locations are almost as many as you can think of. They can be uh, just like a concession, such as uh, the Coca-Cola company has, where they have a set of uh, testing booths of a very simple nature, which they can fold up and put on a train or an airplane, and they go to state fairs and a variety of places where people come by. So they have a sort of have booths, will travel. And this type of situation you can see is temporary as long as the fair or whatever the event is occurring, they'll be there. The temporary location can be a shopping center where, in fact, uh, you rent a store or you'll have a card table. There can be all kinds of degrees of sophistication. But basically, again, you can have people just walking by or it can be an active type of situation in which you may invite particular people to come to this location. Sometimes they're even less sophisticated than the shopping center. It might be the, a church basement or the YMCA or a large living room. It all depends on the circumstances under which you have to test. Uh, at, you can see that the degree of control uh, to the extent to which people are separated from one another can vary quite a bit depending in part on the kind of central location and in part on the degree of controls that you exercise as the experimenter. Uh, it's possible to achieve a degree of separation among people uh, depending on the kind of central location even though you don't have a laboratory setting. Those of you who may have uh, attended the California Reaction Council at the California State Fair, that is a semi-permanent activity in the sense that it's permanently there every time they have the fair. And if you've noticed how that operates, it probably is a good example of exactly how not to run a consumer test. If you're interested in valid data, I mean, you can get all kinds of data from it. And if somebody would like to see a medal that I've won someday there, I'll be happy to show it to you. Um, it was on diet peaches. That was before saccharin was disallowed. But they have a lot of interaction among people, which I think would tend to obviate the validity of the kinds of results that they get. Uh, unquestionably, there are some differences, I'm sure, that are obtained among products, but I think the sensitivity of such a test is very low, and certainly the validity would be highly questionable. Where's another location? Well, in homes. Uh, these can be tests in which people can go door to door and uh, shove a couple of products at you and say, taste one and give me your opinion, very quick if you will, in and out type of test, or it might be a much longer drawn up, drawn out type of test in which the products are distributed to a very carefully selected group of people, and the product may remain in the home for one or two weeks, and people may use the product in the normal way they use it, or according to the instructions, over quite a lengthy period of time. And uh, the area of in-home testing itself we could spend, uh, you know, a lecture on, but it's one place that consumer testing is done that I think we all agree has a lot of face validity. This is where people, other than eating in restaurants, ordinarily consume food. Another place is in stores. And this is a tricky area in the sense that it kind of overlaps what might be a traditional test marketing. In other words, if a company just markets a product and looks at the sales, is that consumer research? Well, from a sensory evaluation standpoint, it isn't at all. On the other hand, if you move back to, let's say, where you control the test more carefully, or let's say you only select two stores 
and in those two stores, let's say you put in two types of products, and you uh, have somebody stationed there to hand out postcards, or they're attached to the product, and there's feedback from the evaluation of the product rather directly, and maybe you follow up by calling a certain number of these people and talking to them over the phone or visiting them. In this sense, it can become more, uh, more of the traditional sensory evaluation in the sense that you're getting more controlled information. Now, some tests like this are run. As you might imagine, they're not as common because they're expensive. And they're difficult in some ways to control because of many, many factors in, you know, that affect the why a person buys a particular product. But it does serve, in, in one sense, to be able to get additional information. Now, there are some kinds of uh, actual product evaluation in stores. But generally, these are not for evaluative, but rather for promotional purposes. Anybody that's had a cracker shoved at them with something spread on it in the store and eaten it uh, has experienced this type of sampling. I wouldn't consider this consumer research. Uh, I, I'll admit if uh, everybody you spit it out and threw it on the floor, that the person who running it might report back that they don't want to take that job anymore because uh, people make all kinds of faces. But it would have to be something extreme like that. Most of the time, uh, people uh, are moving and are polite enough, so if they don't like it, they just don't take seconds. So this is not what I would consider a consumer research activity. Now, from the kinds of things that I've mentioned, in terms of where consumer type testing is done, you might ask yourself the question, well, this is not uh, the kind of thing that I think of as sensory evaluation. Who does this kind of work? And that sort of begins my section on who. I've divided it into who does it and who in terms of the people that are actually doing the testing. OK, who is the experimenter? Well, in the laboratory, it's clear that it could easily be somebody who's trained in sensory evaluation technique. Uh, if it's a central location type test, it could easily be somebody in sensory evaluation. And uh, I may have mentioned, I'm sure I did to people who've taken other classes from me, that uh, this type of uh, mobile central location device is not uncommon in many food companies. And it is run by the research and development sensory evaluation people. It's essentially a bus outfitted with taste panel booths that travels around to shopping centers. It's temporary in the sense that it moves around. Campbell's has one, Hunt Wesson has one, and there may be more. But uh, certainly, sensory evaluation personnel may be involved with this type of facility. For in-home and in-store tests, it depends very much on the, the company and its management philosophy, its size, many, many factors. But it's possible that people trained in sensory evaluation could be involved to one degree or, or more in an in-home type test or in an in-store test. Generally, when you move to these type of tests, market research people from the marketing side of a company are usually the responsible individuals. Not always, but usually. In a company that is, uh, I would believe, doing a better job in its management of product development I would hope that sensory evaluation people would be involved in some way, even in the market research tests that are conducted by market researchers from marketing. So the answer to the question about who is, is an indefinite one, certainly some things are more traditionally conducted by sensory evaluation personnel, such as in laboratories and in some central location tests, and on the other hand, traditionally in-home or in-store tests have been conducted by market research people. But this barrier, this, if you will, this wall is becoming less and less definitive. And I see more and more people, maybe it's uh, osmosis, I'm not sure, but they're moving on either side of it. And I think this is a good thing. OK, let's take a look at who, in terms of the people that one samples as consumers. The first problem that one has is, who is the population that you care about in terms of this particular evaluation? And although this may seem like a very simple problem at first, uh, it's remarkable how complex it can get. It's pretty 
I think, clear that if one were developing a product for infants, uh, that you'd say, well, infants are the one who should evaluate the product. And yet we know that many baby food companies develop products in which the parents are the, are the population because they believe the parents are so determining in what the child likes or dislikes by their behavior toward the child while they're feeding it, that rather than run a, 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 an infant test, they run an adult test. Now, that, now, this is probably more true for infants, but to some degree it would apply, let's say, to the junior age. And Beyond that, I would think that there would be a, a definite responsibility to look into use of children as subjects in one of these tests themselves. And I've done tests, and many other people have done tests, with very young children in which the results have been meaningful. But certainly, it, as I said, is not as simple as it might appear on the surface. It might be a population that has to do with a certain uh, age or sex characteristic. You're only interested in men or women, or you're only interested in people above or below a certain age. Or it may be you're only interested in the population of people who drink wine or drink a particular brand of wine. Or it may be that you care only about people who use a certain product. Or it may be you only care about those who use a certain product at a certain frequency. They're heavy users. Now, all of these decisions are made on the basis of the problem that you're trying to solve. And if you don't think about them, you can make what is our very large errors in determining what your results mean in terms of solving the problem when you've completed your work. Okay, you've selected the population. Now, the chances are that you can't test all of them. Now, unless you pick a nice, simple population like uh, this class, and you say, that's the only people I care about, and it's pretty easy to get everybody. But as soon as you go into the uh, world of trying to look at, let's say, who buys products, you can see that this population is going to grow quite rapidly to the point where you can't get everyone to evaluate your product. So you have to sample them in some way. Now, this sampling process is, a, again, maybe apparently a very simple one, but again, just as with choosing a population, it can be complex. Basically, there are, I guess, three, three types of samples. The probability type sample, in which you have a type of sampling which you have a great deal of confidence about the statistical analysis and the statements you can make about the sample with relationship to the population. You have a judgment sample, which is a sample that's basically one that is not chosen on a statistical basis, but more in terms of your experience that says, in fact, this sample will predict for me something I care about. And there's a lot of judgment sampling that's done in sensory evaluation work. For example, if one were to use those people who are within the company as employees, uh, it's very likely that this sample is not chosen in some probabilistic way, but yet there may be evidence that the results from this type of test are predictive of how people perform, let's say, in in-home tests or in the marketplace. So on the basis of judgment, you say we can use this type of sample. The third type is uh, related in a sense to judgment, and it's called convenience type sample, and it's basically a sample you can call it the lazy man sample if you want. It's who's ever available. In psychology, uh, this college sophomore was considered the convenience sample. And in the literature, you're, there are literally hundreds of thousands of studies run on college sophomores. Not that they're not important, but there are obviously you know, freshmen and juniors and seniors and graduate students and people who aren't at the university. In many areas, uh, convenience samples, by judgment, may prove to be ones that are of some value. But in terms of the uh, generalizability of the results, one has to be quite cautious about what they mean. Well, let's take a look at the probability sample in terms of the various ways one may go about selecting such a sample. The simplest and yet most difficult kind is the simple random sample in which every member of the population has an equal chance of being chosen. Now, that is not so easy to do. It's an easy thing to say. 
but if the sample were 100,000, I mean, the population were 100,000 people, how do you ensure that every one of those 100,000 people has an equal chance to be chosen? Let's say your sample was going to be 200. How can you be sure that all have a chance? Well, the, uh, the only way to do this kind of thing is to tag each member of the population in some way and have some way of randomly selecting those tags, whether they be numbers or whatever code it is. Now, this is not easy to do. Uh, it would be easy to select a random sample from this class. I'd give you all a number, starting one, two, three. I could put all those numbers on some uh, beans if I wanted to, shake them up in a cup and pull out 10, and, and so I'd say I have a random sample. But it's not always easy to be able to tag all the members of the population. And after a certain number of sample sizes, numbering beans, you know, gets to be a problem. So you use random tables. But still, there has to be some way of identifying each one of the people in the population. So pure random samples are not too common, except when the population is reasonably small. Now, there's some ways in which one can, you know, simplify the probability sampling. And that is, in some way, breaking the group down into meaningful categories. For example, one could stratify the group on the basis, let's say it was college students, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And then on that basis, sample randomly within each one of those strata. And that way, you have a stratified random sample. It's not pure random in the sense that uh, going in and giving everybody a, a number and pulling it out of a hat or using a random table. But it does have a certain statistical characteristic which make it very similar to the random sample. Another way I can break up the population is by area. I, these areas could be census tracts. They could be uh, precincts. Uh, that I could just take the city and draw a grid on it if I were working with a city population. But in some way, I divide up. I could divide it up into the states if I wanted to. Then with each, within each one of those areas, I can sample randomly. So I divide first up, let's say, into 50 states. And then I sample so that each person in the state has an equal chance. This is very unlikely to happen as well. So what happens in many cases is that you go through what amounts to a series of groupings. First, I'll say I'll divide it up into states. And I'll choose five states at random. Then within the states, I'll choose you know, five precincts at random or census tracts. And so I, I simplify in some way my job of tagging each of the individuals. Now, as you do this, the statistical uh, analysis changes a little, but it's still a probability type sample because at one point or, or another, and generally as you move along, it involves a random process. In other words, if I pick the five states out because I'm interested in them, that doesn't allow the concept of probability. Or if I pick the census tracts based on what I'm interested in, that's not probable, probability sample. Or within the census tracts, if I pick a certain block because I, I think there aren't a lot of dogs on that block, that's not a probability sample. Not that that is an important factor, by the way, in sampling dogs and other annoyances that might occur in the process of sampling homes. Uh, this is a critical problem. If you've ever done any sampling door-to-door uh, -door type work, uh, it's, it's critical. OK, there's one other kind of sample which can be done in a probabilistic way. That's a quota sample. In this type of sample, you have some knowledge ahead of time of the proportions of certain characteristics in the population. For example, let's just say that uh, you had the distribution of what percent there were of each of five age groups. OK, and you say, I want my sample to be proportional to the percentage of the people in each of those age groups. So you ha set up ahead of time a quota for each of those age groups. You need, let's say, five between the age of you know, five and 10, or 12 between the age of 10 and uh, 15. This quota is set up ahead of time. And then what you do is, as you're sampling, until you get enough to fill that quota, and this sample could be random, you keep going. Then when you fill that quota, you, know, you start filling all the other quotas. But these quotas can be filled you know, simultaneously. I don't want to mislead you. You don't just go out and first get the five to 10. You go out and do your sampling, and as these samples come in, whatever technique it is that you use to sample, you fill up all the various categories. And when it's filled, then you stop. Now, the value of this type of sample is that the aggregate result, whether it be a mean or a median 
is more representative of the population because it represents the quotas in the population of each of these various age groups. You can see the, the problem that might occur, for example, if one were interested in what might be considered a, a population of all ages, and by chance they just happen to uh, stop at houses in which uh, represented an area where there were just older people living, like they somehow got lost in leisure world. Now, if they were to do this without a quota type sample, and even though it was very random in terms of how they picked the people within that area, to say that those people's uh, attitudes toward the products would be representative of young housewives obviously would be quite spurious. So quota samples force you to select people within what you've decided ahead of time are meaningful categories of your population. Now there, you know, there could be, uh, you know, there could be any other kinds of quotas. You can have quotas on, you know, sensitivity to taste. It's, uh, it's whatever is meaningful in terms of your particular study. They're not just necessarily demographic characteristics. You could have quotas on the basis of uh, sensitivity in one way or another. But one of the important criteria, obviously, is you have a way of measuring this kind of characteristic so that you know, in fact, that you've filled up the quota. And in addition to that, you have to know ahead of time just what percentages you want or exist in the population of that particular sensitivity. And these kinds of data are not easy to come by. OK, the uh, convenience and judgment type sample I've basically described in terms of uh, convenience, just what happens to be available in judgment, more in terms of your experience as to what may be a meaningful predictor. By the way, it's not that judgment isn't necessary in using the probability samples, but we think of it in a different way. Okay, let's take a look at a very critical question that always arises in doing consumer testing, as well as laboratory testing, for that matter, for uh, instrument-type evaluation. And that is, how many testers do I use? How many people should make up my sample? This, again, is uh, not an easy question. There are two characteristics which are involved here. One has to do with uh, representativeness, and the other has to do with sensitivity. Certainly, you want to have your sample large enough to represent the various components or categories in the population. But on the other hand, when you end up with the study, you're going to want to make some statements about the results in a statistical way. For example, if there are two samples you're testing, you are going to want to say that one is different, let's say, from the other in hedonic value or preference. And you want to be able to say that with some degree of confidence. In other words, you don't want to be able to say it only if the differences between the two products are you know, so large that it doesn't make any sense. For example, if uh, you had to get a 70-30 win on a paired preference test in order for you to say that these two samples differ significantly at the 5% level, that seems like it's not very sensitive. On the other hand, you can go to the other extreme and have too much sensitivity in the sense that you have so many people you're evaluating that almost every difference you come up with is statistically significant. For example, in many of the large surveys that were run by the Quartermaster Corps, they used four or 5,000 people in those studies. And they used the standard nine-point hedonic scale. Differences of one hundredth of a point were statistically significant at less than the one percent level. Yet, what value is it? Well, you can be very confident that they're, they're reliable. If you were running again with another 5,000 people, you'd find the same thing. But to make some important decisions on that kind of information, such that this product is you know, like better than this one, could be misleading to people who use the information for very practical situations. And that knowledge other than the hedonic value palatability could be very critical in making the decision. If corn was like better than green beans at, you know, at that level, uh, and you say, well, we'll just buy corn, or that's what everybody likes, obviously this would be a spurious kind of conclusion. So at the other extreme, you can find too much sensitivity. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean you can't use the information, but you have to be more practical about using it, not just use statistical significance. If you're running the study in the most sophisticated fashion, 
Before you run the study, you'll make a decision as to how large a difference you want to be significant. You'll have some general information on the variability that you can expect from the kind of measurements you're making. And you know, in general, the size of the population that you're going to be drawing your sample from. Now, if you know that information, you can calculate how big the sample has to be. And I'll, I'll write the formula on the board for you. This is the size of the population. This is the, the variance. This is the variance repeated. This is the size of the population. And this is the standard error squared of whatever measure you're working with. You're working with means or percentages. You have, the standard error will vary depending on what kind of statistic that you come up with. But this can be for percentages. It could be for means. It could be for medians. And what this n is then, when you solve that, is that number of people that you would have to sample in order to ensure that a certain difference will be significant at a certain level of confidence. And you make all those decisions ahead of time. Now, it, uh, it does require you knowing a few things. You have to have an idea of how big the population is. You have to have some idea of the variance. And you have to have some idea of the standard error. Working with uh, certain kinds of experimental situations, one develops an estimate, at least, of what these are. And based on that, by rule of thumb, you say, OK, if I have x number of people, then I know I'm going to have a statistical significance at a certain level. For example, in using the nine-point atonic scale, it turns out that with about 40 people, you can be fairly confident that a difference of a half a scale point will be statistically significant at the 5% level. That's a, that's a rule of thumb. It doesn't always work. But you do get some feel for this. And in that way, you can, in a sense, uh, manipulate in a very positive way how much sensitivity you have. If you take a lot more than 40 people, you're not going to be gaining too much. On the other hand, if you take less than 40, you know you're running the risk of not finding a difference that may be a true one. This area is a very tricky one. And uh, it takes a little bit of experience in working with it. But it's a very critical one. You can waste a lot of time and money. I don't know if you've studied sequential testing at all, but it's a technique to save some money. It doesn't work out too practically, but it's good on paper. You only test the number of people you need until you get statistical significance. So the only problem with that is, is that if you invited people to come in or they're coming to test at a central location, it's hard to tell them to go away. We don't need you. We've got statistical significance. So it generally turns out that you end up testing certain number of people anyway. In instrument type testing, where you're working with people in a laboratory, and you can essentially say, you know, you can stay at the bench, you don't have to come over, it might work fairly well. But even then, many people view sensory evaluation testing as a break. They come over, have do something, get a cookie or a coffee. And if they're turned off too often, they become less willing volunteers in the future. So that sequential testing on paper looks great. In practice, it has some very definite problems. There are uh, company or employee panels, as I mentioned earlier, as a kind of judgment sample. And these panels can be a group of people that you keep constantly using the same ones. You know, like there's 20 people, you keep bringing them over, or 40. Or they can be a large group, 500 or 1,000, from which you draw randomly so as to at least not overwork their particular taste buds and not make experts out of them depending on the kind of company you're in and the kind of facilities you have determines what you're going to get. Selecting a random sample, by the way, from a company population does not ensure that you've got a random sample from a population outside the company. So you have to be very careful that you don't get very sophisticated about something which, in fact, does not apply to others. You've got a very good sample for the population of that company. Whether or not you've got a very good sample for the population that's going to consume that particular product depends on other information that you've you know, had to have gained through other experience. But it certainly does pay to rotate the panelists so that you don't get the uh, gourmands all the time coming over to 
to test just because they're looking for something to fill their belly and some coffee and cookies. And it, it takes a little bit of effort to kind of keep people in line this way, but it, it does, it's worth the effort. It pays to distribute your, your panelists. There are some panels which are relatively permanent, and these are almost always used by market research type people. These panels are maybe 100 and maybe 1,500 people in which they are sent products over a period of time to evaluate them. Uh, generally, these panels, by the way, are not just food panels, but they're panels that may evaluate uh, you know, vacuum cleaners or toasters or food. And they're permanent in the sense that uh, uh, they're hired in some way, they get some reward, and they get products through the mail ordinarily. Uh, one of the permanent panels that all of us are generally aware of is the Nielsen television panel, in which they put a gadget in your television set and they replace people with that occasionally, but it's a relatively permanent panel. As I said, these kinds of panels may be selected very carefully on a random basis to begin with, but one of the criticisms is how long do they stay representative? How long would you be representative if you kept getting products and people kept asking you questions? Pretty soon you begin to feel like you're an expert, and then maybe you'll change and become more particular. Who knows? But it's certainly a criticism that's been leveled in many cases at the permanent panel. Okay, we finished who. Now let's talk about what. The first what has to do with the product. Now generally speaking, when you've been working with stimuli, they've been relatively simple stimuli, and their background and history, their family tree were pretty well known to you. In many cases, when you work with consumer testing, the products are not so neatly defined. For example, if one of the products in your test was a product that was a competitor's brand, and you had the job of, okay, testing that along with, let's say, one or more products of your own companies, you'd find that your competitor's brand, not on purpose, but because the very nature of quality control is not a single product. And especially if you just sampled uh, in an area where, in fact, let's say the product was kind of old, product was old, may not be at all representative of that particular uh, competitor's product. Or it may be that it's different in the east or the west in characteristics, or north or south, on purpose. So that you can see that selecting a sample when it's a production product is not that simple. Even your own company's product, if it's a production product, has within it a large range and variability. And if you just go in and pull product out and happen to get a product which in fact is not representative of what might be considered average production, then it's obvious you're going to be testing a set of stimuli which are going to be limited in terms of how you can generalize. Now, if you prepare it in the lab, or it's prepared in the lab for you, and under control conditions, uh, you can be fairly confident. But most consumer tests, at least at some point, involve product which is a production run. And this becomes a very, very critical problem. Well, let's consider a couple of major factors in this selection. Let's take age of the sample. There are lots of ways in which this can cause some difficulty. That age could be due to the age in the store. In other words, it's been sitting there for a long time. How long it's been since it's got shipped from a manufacturing plant. It could be the age as it sits even in the laboratory. In other words, the product's made in the laboratory, and it's changing, let's say, over a two, three-week period. You know what it was at the beginning of that period, but at the point in which it is finally evaluated, and especially if it's a new product, it's changed color. It no longer resembles the product that you were interested in testing, or it's changed in flavor in some way. There could be lots of possible changes. So age can play a very critical factor in terms of what it is that you're supposedly measuring. Now, in terms of general representativeness, uh, you may, let's say from your own company, get information that says that uh, different plants around the country produce products that are slightly different. So when you sample the product, you may sample from each of those plants. Or it may be a geographical sampling. Uh, with competitors' products, it may very well be that uh, you, know, you have no way of knowing what they're doing. So the only way you can tell what product is is you should be evaluating 
is by doing a large survey of the products that they manufacture, that particular product, and doing some physical and chemical and or sensory analyses to find out how their product varies. I think it's remarkable when one does this to see that many of the nuances that one works with in sensory evaluation in terms of discrimination tests and descriptive tests, if you want to apply them to the same product, either from your own or other companies, you'd find as wide a variation as you do in many cases when you test different products. This is a little discouraging sometimes, but it's reality. And if you, in fact, are trying to select a product to test, you want to be very certain that it represents what you're interested in. I guess one of the best rules to follow is to do those physical, chemical, and or sensory tests before a consumer evaluation that allows you, if nothing else, to know what you've tested, even if it isn't exactly what it is that you wanted to test. Ideally, you would say you would not test a material that did not somehow meet some standards that you've set up or have been set up that characterize that product. It might be a profile, or it might be the fact that it uh, passes a triangle test, or it might have uh, uh, some other quantitative descriptive characteristic. But unless one does some of this type of testing, laboratory instrument type testing, if you will, you can be terribly misled as to what it is that you find in your results when you finally get them back from a consumer type test. So I can only say that you have to be you know, careful in the way in which you select a particular product to sample. It's, as I said, it's no guarantee, but it does help quite a bit in understanding the data. Okay, let's take a look at uh, stimulus presentation as part of the question of how. In other words, we've talked about why, where, who, what. Now we'll talk about how. And a lot of these things, I'm sure, are redundant with other sensory evaluation knowledge that you've obtained, but we'll review them in terms of the context of consumer testing. One of the standard things that one cares about is the temperature of the sample. In the laboratory, one is generally more concerned with the constancy of that temperature, as long as you're not burning somebody's tongue off or freezing it in place. If all the samples are the same temperature, you're generally fairly comfortable about the results. In consumer testing, we have to add the component of, of realism or appropriateness. If, in fact, a product is ordinarily consumed at a particular temperature, and hopefully you have that knowledge, then that's the temperature within some reasonable band that that product should be served in a consumer test. If it's normally served at, you know, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, then that's as you want to get close to that temperature. If it's normally served at a refrigerator temperature, right out of the refrigerator, that's the temperature that you want to try to serve it at in the consumer test. There, I guess there's, I, I don't have to tell you how much variation you might expect to get in results if in fact you didn't do this. You can get a reversal from one sample being preferred over another to just the opposite by changing the temperature of the sample. Now what the correct temperature is, as best we can judge, would be that temperature which is most similar to the one in which the product is ordinarily consumed. Now, you can say, well, some products are consumed at more than one temperature. They maybe have to run two tests. In other words, I, I know it isn't always simple to select this, but certainly it can make a critical difference in terms of the results that one obtains. Another sample problem in terms of stimulus presentation is how big should the sample be? Again, in instrument type testing, uh, there's certain practical contingencies, how much sample you have, obviously. Uh, you want to fill the mouth with the sample. Uh, you don't want it so small that uh, you, can't, you, know, you can't notice it, nor do you want them to put so much in their mouth at one time that they gag on it. But you can pick a amount and feel fairly comfortable if you can control it that you're going to get meaningful results. Again, in consumer testing, the same general principle applies, but again, we have to add the principle of realism. For some samples, for example, having what might be considered to be an appropriate amount to, to taste it completely may not be an appropriate amount in order to get as valid a measurement of its consumer uh, value. For example, let's say this sample is ordinarily eaten as a food in a certain normal serving quantity. And that normal serving quantity 
let's say after you get uh, maybe it's eight mouthfuls, by the time you get to the sixth mouthful, there's a characteristic in that product which just comes on strong. Maybe it's a physiological characteristic, maybe it's just uh, fatigue or time, but there's a change with the amount of sample you eat. Now, you know, from some things like bite, this can be a very strong component that can change as you consume it. Or oh, the fact that in the descriptive type evaluations, they have time evaluations as part of the evaluation of the product indicates that this is an important factor. Although ordinarily their time span is a fairly short one. I'm talking about something that might be, you know, as much as uh, five minutes of consumption. Now this is tricky, and it's really a judgment as to how appropriate, how real you want to get. Because you can throw back at me, well, certainly I eat, uh, you know, a cup of mashed potatoes, but I don't eat it all at one time. I have a little salad and a little meat. And you say, well, now, how can I demonstrate that? Well, it gets to be pretty tough. In other words, if you start building in the characteristics that have to do with the other tastes in the mouth at the time, it gets tricky. But certainly it would seem appropriate to think about the sample size in terms of the way it's normally consumed when you make this kind of decision. Utensil selection. Again, in the laboratory, uh, you certainly want everybody to use the same utensil or container. Uh, and it could be something, you know, it could be a beaker, very nice little Erlenmeyer beaker. And everybody's happy. But on the other hand, people don't ordinarily consume their food at home in Erlenmeyer beakers. Unless you happen to be a chemistry student, it's kind of poor, I guess you might take, <laughs> take a few home occasionally. So what you want to do is try to have a container and utensils which are appropriate for those particular products. You know, if you try to pick up peas with a, fork, a knife, you know, it's a little bit difficult. It's not quite that bad, but certainly the use of a spoon or a fork could produce a different result relative to the liquid that one is going to consume in, with regard to the product. If you're eating a peach and you use a spoon, you get some of the liquid. If you're using a fork, you get very little of it. And so although it may seem like a very trivial thing, it can be quite meaningful in determining what people really think about this particular product. Plastic versus metal, there's you know, all kinds of you know, factors involved here. Frankly, uh, I think that plastic works quite fine. You might say, well, that's what people use on picnics and not at home. And I'd say I'd like to test those things out. My experimental mind says I'd like to try that. I know plenty of people who use uh, paper cups and souffle cups and uh, things you don't use at home and plastic silverware, and they get fine results. But I think that you ought to think about these things and not just take them for granted. It may be, you know, just because the plastic doesn't have any taste, maybe if it's an item which one, let's say, uh, normally consumes as a portable item, maybe one could use plastic wear because that'd be appropriate. Whereas if you're eating it at home, maybe it would be more appropriate to use some kind of uh, hard utensil. Okay, let's take a look at number of samples then. Again, in doing work in the laboratory with instrumental type panels, one certainly considers the interaction among samples and how many samples you can serve. In consumer type testing, uh, it certainly applies in the same way. You might say that as the samples get more complex, as they do in many food stimuli, uh, that you have to be perhaps a little bit more careful about the contrast that might occur. For example, if one were to serve you know, a big piece of pizza and follow it by some, uh, some ice cream and th then follow it by some caviar and had only, you know, and then had a, another final sample which was a dill pickle, that there are four items and maybe four items is not too many to take, but you start running into contrast effects and convergence effects so that the attitude toward an individual sample is a function not only of that sample itself, but what preceded that sample. And so you get into problems of what things can you put together in one test in a meaningful way. Now, if it's all milk samples, you know, maybe that isn't a big problem if the samples don't differ too widely. And you can only tell by trying it, by the way. Maybe you can find you can get very sensitive results with, you know, 25 different samples. On the other hand, if they're quite different, uh, you can say, well, that helps in some way because people don't get fatigued, they don't get bored. But on the other hand, maybe the sample contrasts are so peculiar that although you may balance very carefully the order in which you serve the samples, pickles and ice cream are served an equal number of times in each position, you're losing a great deal of overall sensitivity. Everything balances out very neatly to nothing. You get, you know, you get no differences 
even though no one sample has gotten any particular bias. So this is an important characteristic in consumer type testing. Another is the general time factor. Uh, in the laboratory, instrumental panels ordinarily can be kept for a longer period of time because they usually work in that particular company laboratory. When you're using consumer people, well, especially let's say they're walking by, uh, where they're casual people that are coming by, or even when you go to their home and it's door to door, you don't have all the time you want. So the number of samples you choose will be a function in part of how much time is available in a practical way to do the test. Another characteristic in stimulus presentation is the instructional set. Uh, I think in instru instrumental type testing, it's obviously important. If you tell somebody they're tasting salt and they really have got sugar, you're going to get some problems there. But you get some nuances in consumer testing, uh, sometimes of a subtle nature, which can cause major changes in the results. A very obvious one, it's not very subtle, is the name of the product. If I tell somebody the brand name of the product they're evaluating, I get back a tremendous amount of bias relative to what that particular consumer feels about that product, regardless of what it may taste like. And there are lots of tests done to show that the brand name can, in fact, uh, move products all around the scale in terms of how people like or dislike them. Another thing may be very, a much more subtle thing in terms of uh, if you tell somebody it's a certain type of product. If you're developing a new product, really kind of new in a way. Uh, for example, it's a new tomato product that's a drink, and there's nothing else like it in the market. Uh, if you call it tomato juice, you'll get one kind of response. If you call it a tomato with lemon flavor, you may get a second. And if you call it uh, your morning perk up, you may get a third. In other words, depending on what instructional set that you give to people, they are going to view the product in a slightly different way. Which one you should use depends on how you've defined the problem. Uh, it's not a simple matter to say one or the other. Most people who work with products like to get some blind testing in which no names are used, in which people's, if you will, pure affect is determined. If anything can be determined, it's really pure in that sense. And then in addition to that, study the effects of giving people information such as the name or a particular type of product class or any other particular kind of set. I remember one dramatic set difference when I was at the Quartermaster. It was a survival bar. It was about that long and about that thick in cheese and cereal, and, and there was a meat one, I think. Uh, it, it was not, from a pure standpoint of affect, very good. And when it was rated and given to people, I think people thought of candy bars, you know, when they first dated. And it just, you know, bottomed out the scale all the time. Then we gave them to people and said that you've been on a desert island for two weeks, you've had no food, and this packet, you know, comes up in a, uh, in a small waterproof container floating up to the beach, and you open it up, and that's all you've got. Uh, that's paraphrased, because I don't remember the exact words. But the product rated much higher, uh, because people were thinking about it now in terms of a particular context. Now, they weren't actually starving, and they weren't actually there, so we aren't really having exactly the proper situation. But you can see how much you can shift what people will think about a product, determining, you know, based in part on the kind of instruction that you give them. Lastly, I want to talk about atmosphere factors. Again, these are the same kinds of things one would consider in instrumental type testing, such as the temperature of the room, uh, the sound in the room, and the kind of light. The only thing I'd like to add are some of the consumer characteristics that might be emphasized. For example, in temperature of the room, uh, one would want to be careful not just to control the temperature, but perhaps to have it representative of the uh, normal eating conditions that that product will be consumed under. In other words, if for some reason uh, this is going to be consumed in a warm area, then one should have the temperature warm. If it's going to be consumed where it's cold, one should have it cold. Now, I won't argue the fact that uh, they haven't, the, you know, the panelist, if it's a panelist, hasn't lived there, and so they really haven't got it quite the same way. They have some uh, living quarters up at uh, Natick in which they put people in a big metal bubble in which they can control all the environment. Most of us cannot uh, grow our subjects in quite that same way. <laughs> but it's still, there is some thought that one should give to the temperature other than just the fact that it's reasonably constant. One should think about constant at what level and how does this apply? 
to the normal eating condition. Sound, uh, again, generally we don't want distraction. Uh, I don't know about any good tests done in this area, but much of what we eat is done under the influence of noise, whether it's the television or the kids or your roommate. Or, now, I don't know how this affects uh, people's attitudes, attention, but I'm sure it does in some way, and one ought to think about that a little bit. Uh, should you control for it? Should you put noise into the system? I don't have any simple answers to that, but it's something to think about. Light, again, one can get controlled illumination, have a standard uh, incandescent light or a fluorescent light, but if one thinks about the normal conditions under which the product is consumed, it might be different. For example, do you know there's a normal uh, standard C illuminant that's uh, used for color testing? Now, to use that illuminant would be very nice for some instrument type tests, but for consumer type testing, it would be impractical. Very few housewives, either in the store or at home, have a standard C illumination. Maybe you'd find out that, in fact, that uh, fluorescent is the commonest or maybe incandescent, or maybe you'd want to try it both ways. Uh, this is, by the way, where you're not masking the, the color of the product in any way. If, in fact, you're trying to cover up some characteristics, then you may try to put a light in there that, let's say, masks a certain color difference. But this is obviously not as realistic a consumer test as when you have it under you know, standard illumination. Now, there are probably some conditions I haven't covered that uh, you have, and uh, but I think it gives you a feel for stimulus presentation characteristics that one should think about in terms of a consumer type test. Okay, and how now let's talk about the questionnaire of the ballot. What can we say about the how in this case? Well, what I'd like to talk about is a sample, if you will, of the population of kinds of hows in this area. There are literally an unlimited number of kinds of scales that one can utilize. What I've done is break them down into basic types of scales from a psychological categorization, if you will. The first type is the ordinal type scale. An ordinal scale, as it sounds like, gives you order. The very simplest kind of ordinal scale is a paired preference scale. I like this one better than this one. Okay, that's pretty easy. As one extends the ordinal scale, it then becomes a ranking scale. Instead of two things, you have three. If you have three, I like A, then B, then C. Obviously, one can take the ranking to any number that one can feel you can handle efficiently from the standpoint of stimulus presentation conditions. Now, ranking type scales tell you, as I said, order, which samples are liked better than which other. The interval type scale is the second type, and this is the common type scale that you've become familiar with with regard to hedonic type scales, like the nine-point hedonic scale, from a dislike extremely to like extremely. You might be interested in knowing that in studying the various length of scales of this type, that about seven points from a statistical standpoint is where you could say you get a very good cutoff point. When you go to nine, you don't get too much better, doesn't get worse. 11 doesn't seem to give you too much at all. And after that, the amount of information you get seems to drop off a little bit. So there's nothing wrong with using a nine-point scale. But if for some reason you wanted to go to a seven, there's some evidence that, in fact, this is not a bad thing to do. And if you go back to the psychological literature on scaling, you'll find that uh, even a five-point scale has been used in some occasions. But seven has been kind of a you know magic number. Seven, by the way, gives you a midpoint. And some people like a point where you can say, I'm in between. Other people don't like it. And this is a matter of, uh, to some extent, personal experience bias, rather than the fact that we can say experimentally, no question about it, the uh, neutral point is absolutely necessary, or there's no question about the fact you should throw it out. There's another kind of rating scale that's commonly used in consumer type testing. It's an agree to disagree type scale. In other words, you make any statement about a food or a characteristic, and then you have a scale next to it. It could be two points or three or four or five, which goes from you know, strongly agree to strongly disagree. So there's some statement made, and you as a consumer then would respond to it in a particular way. Uh, this type of scale offers you a little bit more uh, nuances in terms of the kinds of questions that you can ask uh, 
about a particular product. Now, in the area of rating scales, you can run into another category of uh, looking at the ways in which they measure things, which I put on a continuum from what you might call pure affect to pure action. On the affect end, you have things such as like and dislike, in which you're just finding out how much people like or dislike something and it supposedly measures just feelings. At the other end, where you have pure action, is where you ask people questions like, how frequently do you eat this? Or would you eat this? In other words, you're asking the consumer to give you a question that relates to a very specific piece of behavior. Or it might be a question that relates to buying. I would buy this every time I shop, every other time, sometimes. The scale then measures some component of real action. Now, uh, what's the advantage and disadvantage? Well, it's clear that uh, when you get more and more specific, you may lose to some extent some of the uh, you know, ability to discriminate on a pure affect way and bring in things such as cost of the product or uh, characteristics that have to do with satiety. In other words, and when you start people getting people to give you definite action statements, you may bring in more than what we might call palatability. Now, I developed a scale which is not in much use called the FACT scale, F-A-C-T, which combines some of the action and some of the affect. And the FACT scale has, at the top, I would eat this every opportunity I had, to the bottom of I would eat this only if I were forced to. This is a scale which combines if you will, the affect component and the component that has to do with action. In other words, you, you have to say how you like it, but in addition to that, you're saying how you'd behave toward it in some way. Now, this scale gets you very similar results to the hedonic type scale that's just pure affect, but there are differences in terms of sensitivity to certain kind of product differences, and there seems to be a generally depression of what people will rate as far as a nine-point scale. Whereas a product will rate an eight, let's say, on a hedonic scale, it might rate a seven on the fact scale. And it makes sense. I might say I like, you know, peaches extremely. On the other hand, if I'd say I'd eat this every opportunity I had, I might think about that a little bit. So that it tends to make people, if you will, a little bit more realistic about their judgments. Okay. Uh, Let's look at the last type scale, ratio scale. A ratio scale is a scale in which people essentially make judgments on a ratio basis. The simplest type is a magnitude estimation type scale in which, let's say, I give you a food product and I say, this food product is worth 100 in terms of how well you like it. Now I give you another product and I say, how well do you like this relative to that 100? If you like it twice as well, give it a 200. If you like it half as well, give it a 50. Now, I can give you a number of products, and using this sort of built-in standard, you give me ratio judgments. Now, one of the advantages, if there is one in the ratio type scale, is that when you get the result, you can make ratio type statements. For example, in the interval type scale, if I have one product that averages an 8 on the hedonic scale and another a 4, I cannot make the statement statistically that that eight sample is like twice as well as the four sample. On the other hand, in a ratio type scale, if one sample comes out at 200 and the other comes out 100, I may make that statement. Now, whether that's of any particular advantage, I guess, depends on what, your, what kind of problem you're trying to solve and how sophisticated you want to be. The ratio scale does work, and I've used it with consumer type judgments but it is just, you know, it scares people a little bit to think they can do that. But they can. They do pretty well. I, I've seen several examples in which this type of scale has been used. So we have the ordinal scale, then the interval scale, and the ratio scale. Now, the kinds of things we do with those scales obviously depend on the kinds they are.